because since mm -hmm. I have my PowerPoint yeah. open. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, let's get, we'll go ahead and get started. So the title of this workshop is Relationships as a Remedy. And I added, and also a tool for transformation, because from my point of view, uh, relationships are, can be so helpful, especially with the stressors we're facing right now. Um, so they can really be, from my point of view, a remedy for um, periods of stress. And then beyond that, they can really help us thrive and evolve as humans and access more of our potential. Um, so that's why I chose the title. Um, and just uh, briefly, about who I am, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Melissa Ryan. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a licensed professional counselor. Up until uh, COVID, I had a private practice in Golden out of the Golden Wellbeing Collective. Um, this is a really awesome space. And I don't have that space anymore. Fortunately, the, the um, landowner was able to find somebody to rent out my old office space. Um, and so since COVID, I've been entirely telehealth, um, which I thought was going to be challenging. Activity based. And so I thought it was going to be a weird transition, but so far it's going really well because what I have found to be most helpful um, is just really guiding people um, to access somatic practices. And we're going to be talking a lot about that in this presentation and what somatic really means. It comes from um, the Greek word soma, which means body. So it's really about practices that help you tap into your own physiology and your nervous system, which is so key in terms of responding to stress. And it also is really helpful in terms of relationships and how to influence relationships and um, positively impact teams and really bring um, calming energy to your families and all that. And so um, it's all interconnected as you're going to see in this presentation. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So I think it's important to have a game plan. That's my partner pointing to this big trail um, that we did, this ride we did in Steamboat. And so here we are, we're going to begin the adventure. So first we're going to start, I'm going to go over just our working agreement, some additional things I want to cover. Um, while Crin's on the call, she, she can appreciate it. So it's going to be basically my disclaimer. Um, so we're going to go over that. I'm going to talk about the protective factors of relationship, why it's so valuable to invest in relationships and build your relational skills. We're going to discuss uh, our nervous system and unpack some of that. We're going to do an activity because if you're like me, I can only handle so much talking and lecture. I like things that help me engage and apply the learning. I'm gonna go over um, the cycle of relationships based out of attachment research, and then just really talk about how we enhance and build our relationships. And this is all relationships, whether parent-child, relationships with your family of origin, relationships with friends, coworkers, because all these skills that I'm talking about, you can use in any of these relationships. Uh, including your relationship with yourself. So that's pretty sweet because um, they're transferable skills. So you can build on your skill set um, in multiple realms. So my working agreement or my disclaimer. So while I am a licensed professional counselor and I do also offer relational coaching, this is not either of those. <laughs> it's really meant to be more educational and um, skill-based. Skill uh, the other piece I'm going to invite us to bring is what I work with my clients on developing um, or accessing is an adventure mindset. So from my point of view, uh, we learn best when we're open, when we're curious, when we can access our creativity. And for me, adventure is one of those ways where we can really access those skills. So I'm going to invite all of you who are on this call to bring that mindset, to go on this adventure, this journey with me, to leave behind you know, any biases or assumptions you might have about this topic um, and just see what might unfold. That isn't to say it's not valuable to, to check in with your intentions, by what you're hoping to get out of here, out of this workshop. Uh, I think that's always valuable to know what your in intention is, even when you begin an adventure, right? Like it's 
good to know where you're headed. That picture of um, my partner pointing to the trail. We had a rough idea that um, I think that was Fish, Fish Creek Falls that we were um, mountain biking on. And so it's nice to know where you're headed and what gear you need. And so it's definitely great to tap into your intention for why you're here. And I'm gonna invite you to be open and curious about this process. Um, so this might not be coming up in your conversations, but as a counselor, there's lots of discussion about how we create an environment of safety for our clients. Um, and in order to learn, you can't be entirely safe. Like there has to be some risk, a little bit of vulnerability to really um, to expand and, and access more potential. So I'm hoping to create an environment that feels safe enough for all of you to participate and perhaps share in the chat. Um, so that's my goal. With that is the pass rule, which I go over with all my clients whenever they meet with me, which that just really means if I invite you to think about something or answer a question or do an activity, uh, you're always free to pass, obviously. Um, and that's just practicing good boundaries and good self-care, which brings me to my next agreement for our time together. Please take care of yourself. And that includes like, if you have to go to the bathroom, you know, turn off your screen if you can, <laughs> leave the audio and just head out, you know, like, uh, it's so often in my sessions, clients will like hold their bladder and then they'll be like, oh, are we done? And then they just like run, run out of the room. That seems really unnecessary. Like we can take two minutes to take care of our needs. And so I'm going to encourage you to do that, especially since this is recorded. So if you miss something and come back to it, um, and snacks, like, so this is again about taking care of our own ecosystem. And so, um, I myself have <laughs> food sitting right in front of me in case I get hungry. Um, so just, you know, checking in, seeing what you need, water, et cetera, because so many of us are on screens while it's so helpful to see, I mean, I love seeing everyone's beautiful faces. Um, it helps me feel like I'm not just talking in my office by myself. Um, it is still like, there is such a thing as screen fatigue. So if at any point you want to turn off your screen, you know, that's encouraged. Take care of yourself. And my last working agreement is I sometimes use curse words for emphasis or they might slip out. I think this is really comes back to my first job ever was working on a construction uh, site as like a project engineer when I was like 17. And then I worked on construction sites after that. And that's forever changed, <laughs> changed me. Um, and also, I, you know, I sit a lot with folks who have really gone through a lot and sometimes it's really hard to just be like well that was really difficult i mean if something's fucked up it's fucked up and just saying it as it is seems to resonate with me so that comes out like it just did just sit with it i guess and if it really offends you let me know in the chat okay so all that to say one of the things i really want to emphasize here and we're going to come back over and over again is how we manage our own nervous system has a huge impact on how we experience the world and our relationships. So I thought we would start with just again, being present minded, right? So what we know about the brain is it tends to bounce from what you were just doing to what you're gonna do after this meeting. And it's very rarely, unless you're a Buddhist monk who's been meditating for a long time, it's very rarely in the present moment. And yet, when we can get it in the present moment, we're much less likely to experience such intense anxiety or stress or, um, a lot of mood conditions that don't um, kind of take away from our joy and happiness. So that's why I wanted to start with some breaths. So I'm just going to lead you in what um, in yoga they call cleansing breaths, which is where you're going to breathe in through your nose and then you're going to breathe out through your mouth. And if you make an audible sound, that's great. You can do a sigh. No one's going to hear you because I'm mute, but I'm going to go ahead and lead us in that. And it's just three deep breaths. That's all we're doing. And kind of checking in with your body and seeing where you're holding tension or not, if you like, if it's more advanced. So I'm going to lead us in. So just taking a deep breath in through your nose, feeling your stomach and chest and breathing out audibly if you can. I'm going to lead us in two more. So breathing in. And one more. Breathing in. So just bring it to the present moment, 
I'm going to invite you to come back to that over and over again because it's so invaluable um, in terms of learning too. Like if you're not activated, you're going to be able to take in more of the presentation. So, so I just want to give some context and some research about why it is I'm sharing the things I'm sharing. Um, so I guess this is not going to be a surprise to anyone, but um, a lot of the surveys that have been done by stress research centers and the American Psychological Association, um, their surveys have shown that people are reporting record level stress um, since they began recording stress levels, um, particularly in the months March, April, and May. Um, one of the, the stats out of the APA was that if you uh, are a parent with children or a caregiver with children under 18, 80% of parents reported, um, if you look at the, light, the scale, one to 10, one being little to no stress, 10 being I'm super stressed out, uh, parents, 80% of them are reporting somewhere between eight and 10. On a, out of 10 in terms of stress. So people were very stressed, and that makes sense given what um, demands were put on caregivers at that time. Um, and then like almost 30% of people who didn't have children were reporting similar levels of stress during that period. Uh, and they keep, they've continued to record and stress levels overall are going down. And <laughs> from my experience as a counselor, the ripple effect of that period of time, we're still going to be seeing like that that isn't even I mean for my prediction is families and and workplaces are going to continue to feel the ripple effects of that particular time and then the fact that it's ongoing so because of that there is an increased need for resiliency um, and really tapping into there's so much research now about how people recover from stressful events one of the most potent studies that I refer to a lot um, and is, is really influencing how I decided to put together this presentation is the ACE study, which originally was done by Kaiser. Um, it stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Kaiser was originally looking at adult obesity and factors that contributed to that. And what they found, what they discovered in their study was that folks that were struggling with obesity in adulthood experienced at least one of 10 um, adverse childhood experiences. And there's now been, the study has been replicated many times across the world, producing very similar information. And what's so interesting about the ACE study is it has predictive um, uh, qualities to it where we can look and see if somebody's going to struggle with mental illness as an adult. Are they going to struggle, struggle with a substance use issue? Are they going to have an autoimmune condition? Um, all based off of their these children's lived experiences. And what that really says is when somebody's struggling as an adult, um, often if we look back at their childhood, it can provide context. And it's not like, oh, you just don't, you know, you kind of suck as a human. It's like, no, like actually people who uh, experience these experiences, this, we can predict what those outcomes are. And it totally makes sense that you are having these issues based off of it's, it's how humans respond to very stressful events. This is also really helpful to think about because so many children are impacted by what's going on. With that ACE study, we also, there's been um, studies about resiliency. So one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, kids may encounter these adverse childhood experiences and experience several of them, you know, four or five, but they don't develop these conditions as adults. Well, why is that? Well, that's what resiliency studies started looking at. Like, why do people recover? Um, why do they not develop these conditions? And that is also a key component that I want to bring into our discussion today, which is the main things that come out of resiliency. Like, if there were two categories of what helps a kid not develop um, PTSD or a mood disorder or substance use disorder, um, it's how they feel about themselves in terms of their self-worth, their own like way to manage and self-regulate, and then how they feel about the relationships in their life. Do they feel supportive? Do they feel nurturing? Um, and so um, that's 
this I was checking the chat it doesn't have anything to do with me um so that's really so key in like and it's been shown um there's another study that came out with uh out of the uh disaster in japan around ptsd and the people that did best in terms of recovering and not developing long-term effects from evac being evacuated from their homes were those who had really strong social connections so this is why for me why i'm giving this presentation because for any of you that is struggling in any capacity or you see loved ones struggling, relationship is so key. We have so much research about how it really helps us in terms of struggle and challenges. It not only does that, right? So it not only helps with our resiliency, but it also helps with our satisfaction and happiness. So the longest longitudinal study out of Harvard um, on happiness, the, there's tons of data that came out of that. Um, it's really interesting. They started studying two groups of men. One group was basically some whole homeless young people um, in, in Boston. And then the other group was first year law students or first year Harvard students. And so they followed this group and they've been following them for decades. And then they started following their families and their wives and they're just tracking so much data in terms of their health, um, their mental health, their physical health, what they report in terms of spirituality, income, all this. And lots came out of there, but one of the biggest things that came out of that study was that the single most uh, influential factor on satisfaction and happiness was the, the wellness of their relationships, their connection, how connected they felt and how um, those relationships were doing. So not only does the relationship help with our resiliency, it also helps with just feeling good about life and happiness and joy. Um, another piece I want to bring in around research that I think is so key, this is this, I did an Instagram story on this, which is the five to one ratio. So this comes out of the Gottman's research. They're based out of University of Washington. They, they're a really interesting couple who have applied mathematics to understanding relationships. Uh, most of their research has been about intimate partnerships. Um, but this, <laughs> this stat I think is just helpful to know in terms of relationships relationships, which is a five to one ratio. So what they found is you need about po five positive interactions, feelings for every one not so positive kind of negative feeling or interaction. So that's a lot. And given how stressed everyone is, uh, I imagine those ratios are feeling a little off, which can then color your whole experience of a relationship. Um, because our brain has what we call a negativity bias, which means I explained to my clients that our brain evolved to survive. So it's really designed more to look for threat um, than it is to look for like what is good and comforting and feels so lovely. Um, like it's much more helpful for my brain to know that I should immediately respond if I hear a rattle, aka a rattlesnake, than it is for my brain to be like, oh, that's a cute little bunny and I'm going to go pick it up and it's going to be so soft. Like, it's much more, it's just more beneficial in terms of survival for our brain to have, in a sense, a negativity bias um, and to avoid things that might harm us. That said, we can start to develop that bias about our partners, about um, people we work with, about our children, um, where we start to see this, have this lens where we view what they're doing through this negativity bias lens, um, especially if the ratios you know, we're not having as many positive interactions with that person, we start to, to view them as like, not our friend, and maybe they're a foe, and they're out to get us, and like, and it has a lot to do with how our brain is wired, which is why I'm going to really um, emphasize the importance of understanding your own nervous system. Um, another piece of uh, data and a TED talk that's so good, um, comes from Johan Hari, where he talks about um, addiction and, and that our understanding of addiction isn't right, because what a lot of new research is showing is that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. Um, and that really it's about connection with yourself and what you need to nurture yourself and also um, connection with others. 
And then um, kind of to tie back into that negativity bias, I really am a huge fan of positive psychology and really understanding how we can nurture our, our own optimism. Like we know that we survived to have this negativity bias and we're not trying to get rid of that because that's still very valuable. And the and things that can come up with that um, is that valuable data. And at the same time, if we want more positivity and connection and joy, we really have to intentionally nurture it. Um, that's kind of a lot of about what uh, positive psychologists are discovering. And there are people that there's kind of a spectrum we now see of uh, where people fall in terms of their optimism and positivity. Um, and you can continue to nurture that and really be intentional about that. So even if like the person talking to you right now, me, I have a pretty high level of positivity. Um, and I know that if I'm not mindfully nurturing it and taking care of it, I can get pulled into um, how stressful things are. And particularly right now, I've been doing a lot to continue to nurture that um, while also creating space to process uh, the stress and, and the emotions that come up with this. So that brings me to just a little bit. I want to talk about the autonomic nervous system and then we're going to do an activity. So, Lisa? Yeah. We had a quick question in the chat, and it's actually my question, but um, okay. what are the, the 10 experiences as a child that one might go through based on that ACE study? Um, okay, so it that's a really good question. So it includes uh, witnessing domestic violence or having domestic violence in your home. It includes um, somebody in your family struggle, struggling with substance substances. Uh, it also includes somebody in your family going to jail, um, divorce uh it also includes like experiencing abuse as a child um and that includes neglect physical emotional um, sexual abuse um i think there might be one about like a loved one like death of a, a parent is another one uh, those are the ones i can remember um and i have links to this and so maybe what i'll do is send either my slides or um, information about these different studies if you want to research more, because the link I have about the ACE study also includes how to increase resiliency factors. Um, what's not on there, which is surprising to me, is uh, like if somebody's a refugee, because that's obviously a stressful experience if you leave um, your home country to flee. Um, or if you've experienced war. Um, another thing that's not on there um, is uh, like surviving an actual disaster. Um, another thing that's not on there is just like systemic oppression and what that, how that impacts you. So there are some things that most definitely I think should be on the ACE study that aren't. Um, so they're more just kind of general experiences that a lot of kids might experience. Um, so it's not uncommon for when I work with clients for them to have experienced at least one, especially considering that uh, the divorce rate has remained pretty steady for the last several dec decades, meaning um, it's still 50%. So that says one in two marriages experience divorce. So because of that, um, it's pretty common for kids to experience or, or lots of people to experience at least that one. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say most of my clients I work with uh, tend to come from pretty stable households, and yet they still often have at least one or two ACEs. Um, the tipping point in general is four or more. That's where you see exponentially an impact um, for adults um, if they had four or more ACEs as children. So does that answer your question? Quinn? It does. Yes, I okay. was just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, and it, actually what's so fascinating is probably my first job out of grad school, which I was not equipped to do, was uh, working with folks who had had felonies and um, they were in, on probation, probation and parole. And one of the best groups I ever did with them is I had them take the ACE, uh, ACE quiz, which is just 10 questions answering if they had experienced things. And then we discussed it. And for so many of them, it provided context to how they ended up where they ended up um, and some of the decisions they made. So it was really empowering because so many times people think they're just, like I said, they just think they're a shitty person. 
And I'm like, no, like this has been shown that if you experience this as a human, this is what how humans typically respond. And this is how you ended up where you ended up. Yes, there's decision making in that. And um, there are things that were out of your control and you develop mechanisms to deal with that um, to survive. And they may not be great long term strategies, but they did help you survive some pretty challenging things as a kid. So, um, yeah, autonomic nervous system. So uh, there's a lot of discussion about this in my field because we're finding more and more that like understanding how the nervous system works and working with your nervous system is so key to so many things. And um, the autonomic nervous system, the part that I'm referring to is the part that we don't consciously think about. So it's automatically happening. So we're really talking about physiological processes that are happening behind the scenes, right? So regulating your heart rate and your breathing and all these things. And there's two components of the autonomic nervous system, two branches um, that I wanna talk with us about. So the first being the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is our activation um, part of our nervous system in general. So it's things that get us going. So as you can see, as I'm riding my dirt bike, like more than likely my sympathetic nervous system is engaged. Like I'm breathing hard, my heart rate's going, and that's good. Like I, I don't want to be falling asleep on my bike because that would be dangerous. So like our sympathetic nervous system is very useful. Um, you know, when we wake up in the morning, to some extent it's kicking into gear. Hopefully we're getting enough um, you know, cortisol and adrenaline so we get out of bed. Not too much, but like a good amount so that we can engage in the world. Uh, the challenge is, is our culture, from my point of view, really emphasizes the like sympathetic nervous system. It really kind of makes it so that for a lot of us, it's overactive and we're not really in, ha in harmony or in balance. Because there, the other component to the sympathetic nervous system is, or the, you know, the counter to it is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is often referred to as our rest and digest um, part of our nervous system. And again, you might be like, Melissa, why are we talking about this when we're supposed to be talking about relationships? And from my point of view, um, how we relate to our own nervous system and our own body has a huge impact on how we experience the world and we experience relationships and we can use literally use um, our regulated nervous system to influence and impact those we love because if we're coming from a very grounded um, where our nervous system is in balance we can actually help the term is co-regulate others so if we have a good understanding of how to work with our nervous system um, we can then bring that knowledge and that competency to those around us, which really helps with relationships. And I see the sun coming in, so I might put down, one second, put down my blind. Okay, so the other piece I wanna bring up of why I think we engage the sympathetic nervous system too much, and a good indicator is, I don't know if you guys encountered this when you were in school, but <clears throat> you know, people go, go, go all semester, and then they crash. And usually around finals week, they're sick. They're like, I, or, you know, finals get done and they're sleeping for several days. And it's because <clears throat> I, the system is designed to be in balance and kind of going back and forth. And you, can, you can't have your sympathetic nervous system engage for so long, eventually your, your body gives out. So it's really helpful to start to bring intentionality and to intentionally rest, like I'm doing here. I think I was reading a book for like a few hours. Um, because uh, when you can be much more in balance, um, it, you're just gonna feel much better. You know, like if you're going, 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 and then crashing and going, going, going and crashing, or you need more caffeine and more things, your, your nervous system's definitely not operating at an optimal level. And it has an impact on how you show up emotionally. So this is so huge. In, um, bringing awareness and attention, and I'm gonna get, give some more tools around how to do that, but just kind of wanted to set the stage for that piece. And now we're gonna do an activity, how exciting. <laughs> so um, if you will, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell a story. So we have an opportunity if you wanna close your eyes, if you wanna turn off your screen. I myself love having stories told to me, it's probably why I like Audible. Um, but I'm gonna tell a story and we're gonna, we're gonna take what we've been talking about, what I've been talking about, um, and start to apply it to our own nervous systems and starting to understand what, what it is I'm really saying. So 
like I said, you can close your eyes. Um, this is a true story. Um, and I'm going to take us through, through kind of some different things and then, and then we'll process it afterwards. So um, I'm going to invite you to imagine that uh, you are going to be going on a mountain bike journey um, in northern Montana. And you and your riding partner have decided that you're going to do this trail. Um, it's about 25 miles. Uh, you're going to shuttle it. So that's nice. You automatically gain 3,000 feet in elevation. Um, and it's going to be quite a journey. You know that there's going to be roughly 5,000 feet in elevation gain um, and about 8,000 plus in descent. Um, and like I said, it's over a course of 25 miles. And this description has told you that it's a nice alpine trail. Now, before you even get started, uh, you start to feel just some excitement. Maybe, maybe your stomach isn't quite as settled from breakfast. Um, you start noticing that your chest is maybe, your heart's beating a little bit. Maybe there's some contraction there. Um, and it's hard to tell, are you nervous? Are you scared? Are you excited? Maybe it's a little bit of everything, um, but you're, you're, you're excited to, in some ways to get outside and, and, and check out this trail. So you and your partner get started. Um, and the first part of the trail is pretty chill. You know, you're just um, going up and down and you're taking in the scenes. And then it starts to get challenging. And what you come to realize is this trail definitely wasn't built for mountain bikes. Um, and that the uphill part is too steep to bike. And so you are hike a biking. Um, and there also is this element of maybe some fear in that right next to this trail is 1 million acres of wilderness. So, and you also know that you are in grizzly country. So there's some things that your mind start, might start to do as you go further and further along the trail. And you start to notice that that contraction in the chest is becoming more prominent in part because you're working out, but in part you're, you're noticing some fear showing up. Um, and at one point you and your riding partner get separated. And uh, that gives your brain plenty of time to imagine all the worst case scenarios. You're pretty sure your brain starts thinking that you're going to get eaten by a grizzly and your partner's not going to find you because they're so far away. Um, or, you know, something's going to happen. You're going to be lost in this wilderness because you haven't seen any trace of humans for hours. Um, so your, your brain really starts to take you to this very dark negativity bias. Um, and then you also notice in your ear core, this intuition, this part of you that's like, hey, it's gonna be all right. We've done bound bikes rides before. And you notice this tug of war going on between you. This, this kind of back and forth between the part of you uh, that we would call is represented by the reptilian mind and the part of you that's like, kids call it the wizard mind, the part of you that, that understands big picture, you're gonna be okay, that is inviting you to, to look out at the view and really take it in. And you're going back and forth. And for a while, it seems like um, the struggle is never going to end. But at some point, you still haven't seen your writing partner. And the fear part just takes over and hijacks. And you just feel that adrenaline going through your entire body. So I'm going to invite you to just check in with that. And then finally, you get to the top of the hill. And you see your writing partner. And they're totally calm. They're eating their... Uh, you know, they're eating their granola bar, they're taking in the view, their nervous system is in an entirely different place than yours. Very grounded, very calm, looks very happy. And they ask you, hey, what's going on? And all you can muster to say is, I hate this trail. Um, and they're like, okay, and they give you some food and you start to notice, okay, I'm taking in this food. Um, your nervous system starts to calm down, your heart rate starts to become more balanced and your partner's like, okay, well, tell me what's going on. Like, you know, you mentioned you hate this trail. What, what's that about? And you start to explain, well, you know, I've been pushing my bike for several thousand feet. That was not fun. Um, and my shoes, I need new shoes. And, and, you know, I'm afraid of getting eaten. And your partner's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You know, like that was probably a long time for us to be, to be separated. So how about from this point forward, we take more breaks where we can eat more and um, you know, we're going to we'll plan to, to connect uh, more often where we're not apart as long as we just were since I'm the only one with the bear spray. 
and uh, we're gonna we're, we'll just connect more. And it's and you know what? It's not gonna be a big deal because we're we've got all the gear. We've done many mountain bike rides before. We are we are ready to go. Like you've got this. We've got this. We're a team. And we're gonna figure this out. And so you start to notice that your nervous system starts to be much more regulated. And as you continue, the coping strategies you were trying to use before are much more accessible. And just how powerful it was for your riding partner to give you that reassurance. And so you, you're taking it in, you're enjoying the ride. The last part of the ride, uh, you get 3,000 feet of descent and you're just going down the single track, taking in this beautiful lush forest, having so much fun. And you get down and you, you have a conversation about what that was like. Um, and really take in the entire experience and how you really came together as a team. So I want you to kind of just check in with what that story was like for you. And this is where you're going to participate. If you open up slido.com, this is so cool. I love doing this. Um, I want you to just write a sensation you noticed during that whole story. So anything that showed up, it could be tension, it could be excitement, um, whatever you notice. And, with you all participating, it's all gonna populate and it's so fun. So I'll leave you guys to, to that. Oh, and you need to enter, I forgot to mention that part, the code. So when you go to slido.com, the code is T622. Thank I'm you. sorry, I, I I forgot the question. <laughs> I was busy. Okay. <laughs> okay, I was busy logging in and, and figuring out. Oh, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> oh, just share something you notice in your body. Okay. Or that you notice during the the visualization. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm glad you. I'm sure you're not the only one. So that was good. What was the code again? The code is T622. Thank you. Yes. And I think I'm presenting. Is that not happening? Yeah. So in theory, we should see this. All our words, but I'm not seeing really anything happening. So I don't know what that means. The capital T, I think. Hmm. So in theory, it all populates, but I'm not seeing anything happening. So I don't know if it's just taking a minute. I see everything. It didn't work. So you guys see words populating. Okay. <laughs> I do not. So I don't know why it didn't happen. But that's cool. So, so, uh, <laughs> Jerry, what words are you seeing? Yeah, I was gonna say I can read it to you or screenshot it. So we have yeah. anxiety, sweaty palms, blah, anger, frustration, anxiety, a sense of relief once my writing partner promised to stay more connected, and panic. And panic. Okay, beautiful. And are any of those words bigger? Because that usually means it's come up more more than once. No. Um, okay. Anxiety, the only one that came up twice. Okay, gotcha. So, um, so the, what's most noticeable usually for folks is, is when our nervous system is really activated, right? I mean, there's some relief again with, with um, when the writing partner said, hey, we've got this, but a lot of you, it sounds like noticed that um, experience of when the sympathetic nervous system is kicking in, when our activation is kicking in. Um, and in my experience of working with folks in, dropping into their bodies. That's what they're usually most aware of is, is when their nervous system is activated. So that makes sense. And um, when we start to also notice the nuances of when our nervous system is relaxed, we can start to access just more sensation and data. So a couple of concepts I wanna bring up um, from this story um, with the writing partner is this idea of enlightened self-interest, which my, um, one of my mentors, taught me, I guess, which is this idea that um, doing things based on the awareness that 
what is in the interest of the relationship is an event is eventually in the interest of the individuals that make up that relationship. So with the writing, writing partner, um, it doesn't really make sense to like brush off that, you know, the other person's not doing well, right? Like if you're like, well, you know, good luck. I mean, it sucks that you're freaking out. You, you shouldn't be freaking out. Like brushing that off. Does it, ultimately does it really bode well for the team, right? Like, um, so there's this component of, it makes sense for the writing partner to say, in this case, it's my own partner. Um, it makes sense for him to say like, hey, we are a team, we're gonna get this. Like for him to use his resources, right? He's in the space of peace and calm and really excited about the ride, to use those resources because despite my best effort, you know, my nervous system got hijacked, even though I, do all this work and I practice all these things. And I could, you know, the part of me witnessed was like, your nervous system's being hijacked and you're freaking out and you're not gonna get eaten by a bear. That reptilian part is so strong because that's what's kept us alive as a species. So when it really takes over, it takes over and it's very hard to ground, at least by yourself. And so it's so helpful when you can access grounding through relationship, right? So through uh, my partner saying, hey, we got this, we're gonna be okay it's in his best interest for us to come to, together as a team and for him to use his emotional resources and his um, calm state to help, help me regulate my own nervous system. Um, another piece I want to bring up is this idea of attunement, which also comes out of attachment research. And that really means using all of our senses, so all our data, our emotional intelligence, our own body awareness, um, our thinking, to really understand what a person is experiencing and feeling so much so that we can start to like understand that in our own nervous system. So this is beyond empathy. Attunement really is about that co-regulation piece. And it requires us to really be super present to what's happening and respond to them so they don't feel alone, right? So in that conversation, um, person freaking out, myself, <laughs> um, didn't feel alone, right? Like the partner's like, hey, I got this, we got this. And we can bring this so much to our relationships when we can be present to the other person's concerns. And this is really hard to do because we tend to take their concern as like they're attacking us when really they might not be like, and, and, and this is a good example. Like my partner did not take me saying, I hate this trail as a personal attack because he did, he did choose that trip, <laughs> but, but he interpreted like, oh, she's struggling. Like, how can I support her? I can see she's freaking out. <laughs> how can I attune to her? Cause it's in my best interest that we're in a good space and we can enjoy this, this ride together. I see a chat. Um, oh, thank you, Michelle, for joining us. Um, so, so attunement is so huge. Attunement is really powerful with kids. So this is important um, thing to keep in mind. It's kids, their nervous systems are not developed. They're being wired as they're growing up. And so um, often <laughs> parents will be like, well, can't they control that emotion? Why are they having a temper tantrum? It's like, no, they can't. Like they're looking to you to help them co-regulate. Co so that's Oh, that's why it's so hard being a parent because you've got to have like ninja skills when it comes to your own nervous system and how you regulate your own nervous system so that you can help your kids regulate theirs. Um, and, and if there's any children in your life, like you can be such an asset to them, especially during this time, if you can, if you can attune to your own nervous system and what you need. So that brings me to our next slide, which is a way to think about our nervous system in a, I don't know, in a way that speaks to a lot of people because I know a lot of folks use video games as a, an outlet. So if you think about the health of your nervous system like the health bar in a video game, there are things that like increase your health over time and like bring more energy and there are things that reduce it. And depending on where your health bar is, there might be things that normally would increase your energy, but if your health bar is pretty low, it might drain you further. Right. And so what I'm going to really encourage you to do, because I have my clients do this, is I have them make like a list of things that they're aware of that help them increase their energy overall throughout the day and, and what depletes them. And to think about the goal being 
that you end the day with the same amount of energy you started with. And extra credit, you have more energy than you started with. So it's really thinking about how are you managing your energy throughout the day and, and what, what you're doing every single, you know, throughout the day to, to really extend your life bar. Um, because what I find too is that couples um, and partners tend to get in arguments at the end of the day when both their life bars are depleted. So they're in that, they're in that flashing red zone and in a video game, my understanding means that means you're about to die in a relationship it usually means you're about to have a fight. So this is one of the main ways that you can really, at least on your end, influence how conflict goes in your own relationship. And it's again about how you're relating to yourself and managing your own energy. So uh, this also comes out of intimate research and it's about really understanding how relationships and trust are built. So, uh, I'll talk about the little things, but we'll start kind of with the main circle. So the first circle being harmony. So most of the couples I work with are like, well, we just want to be in harmony all the time. How do we do that? I'm like, well, that's not a thing. And as you'll come to find out uh, about this cycle, which applies to all relationships, because this is really about how we attune, how we connect with one another. Um, I'm going to walk you through all these pieces and hopefully you'll see why we need the other pieces to really enhance trust and connection, right? So harmony is when you're feeling in sync and you're feeling good about a relationship. Then a rupture takes place, which can be a hard word, harsh word, I guess, uh, but it really just means it's a disruption. You're no longer in sync. And a rupture can be something somebody does in the relationship, but it also can be something external. COVID is a huge rupture for a lot of people in their relationships um, and how they're experiencing life. So Rupture takes place, and a lot of times people try to ignore the rupture, like, oh no, it's just how it always was. Ignoring it doesn't make it not a rupture. <laughs> I guess it just extends how long your issues are gonna be. Um, <laughs> this is so funny, I, I was going over this with my partner last night, and he, he thought this part, next part was really interesting. So uh, my mentor talks about the dark night of relationships. So this dark cloud comes in, so the rupture comes in, and we experience this period of disharmony where we feel very out of sync. And usually when this happens, it, uh, it feels like, you know, it's always gonna feel this way or why you might be thinking, why am I married to this person? Or why is this person my friend? Or, you know, if it's a coworker, you're like, oh, they always let me down. It is when you're feeling so negative. It's when that negativity bias of the brain is just kicking in. And really it's a survival mechanism, your, your self, you're trying to self-preserve um, and it can feel so dark. And why I laugh is because my, my partner was like, oh, that's when I, I felt that way about our friend. I was like, yes, you did. Um, and it took some time, right? So uh, the next piece that is so critical that I actually figured out from one of my clients, which isn't in the orig original model, which is self-care. So really, in order to move into repair, what has to happen before that is that the people in the relationship need to get to a place where their nervous system isn't hijacked, where they're not freaking out, where they're much calmer and grounded and can see the whole picture um, and can get to a place of like, okay, when I go talk to this person, it's because I really do want to repair. I love them. I care about them. They're an important member of my team, whatever it is, really getting clear on your intention before you talk to them. And if you're still like, well, I want them to say they're sorry, not time to repair, not the time. <laughs> you need more self-care. And when I'm talking about self-care, it's intentional practices that really help you process what you're feeling um, so that you can get to a place of greater perspective and so that you can attune. And in order to attune, you can't think they're the enemy. You've got to be able to feel like this is a person I love and I really want to help us get back to relationship. Um, so repair is where I had to grow the most and where most of my clients, um, are looking to grow because we're often not taught these strategies. I mean, most common people's strategy for repair is time. They're like, well, we'll just, we're just not going to talk about it. And a few weeks will go by and then we're friends again. And that might work short term, but over time it will be easier and easier for rupture to take place because you're not addressing why you ruptured in the first place, right? So um, this is why I like adventure experiences because 
they really <laughs> walk you through this whole thing, right? Uh, of the rupture and the disharmony and then coming together, right? We build connection and trust through the struggle. Um, the, the repair process is what deepens the relationship, is where trust is built. So avoiding it, really, we miss out on our opportunity to become, to deepen intimacy and connection with those in our circle. And that's why it's so important. And that's why you don't want to be, like, the goal is not to be in harmony all the time. Um, it doesn't mean we don't want to nurture more harmony. Uh, it just means that, like, we're not also trying to avoid the rupture because the rupture repair process, research has shown, is what develops trust in relationships. So you think about any time if you do any adventures and you go on this great, you know, adventure with some people and you, of course, are going to run into adversity. Um, after the trip, you're like, gosh, I feel so connected to them. It's because you went through the struggle together. And that's what I see so often is people experience some sort of event and they're, they're trying, there is a piece of processing it on their own, but they don't come back together. And that's what's really gonna build um, connection. Some other things I listed here is, I love this, this came out of Glennon Doyle's book, which is really being clear on what is okay in, your relationships, not who versus who is okay. Because if you're clear on the what, then it's easy to determine how, who you let get close to you. Um, the other piece I talked about is check your intentions before you try to repair. Make sure, make sure you actually want to repair, not that you want to prove your point. Um, really thinking about location, location, location. So our nervous system becomes activated by what's happening externally. So Usually don't have a deep conversation. I, I, I usually suggest don't having it in a car because you can't look at each other and that could be dangerous. Um, also, uh, you know, like don't have it in the middle of the office, you know, go somewhere like and getting outside is so huge because there's a lot of research about how that helps calm our reptilian mind down. So really thinking about like, what is the vibe? You want a really supportive, nurturing vibe if you're gonna have a difficult conversation and work towards repair. Um, I just wanted to bring up that you can also think about, you know, a relationship is its own entity, and that's how when I do counseling with couples or families, we're talking about not only the individuals, but then the relationship that they're co-creating, and that's its own entity. And so really paying attention to its health. Um, obviously, the individuals that make up their relationship, their own health. It's going to influence the health of the relationship, but really thinking like, what are the things that we're doing every single day if it's a close relationship or once a week if it's like, you know, a work relationship to increase the connection, to increase the health of that relationship? And what are the things that reduce that connection and being mindful of that? Um, okay, I have just a couple minutes. So the last piece I wanted to talk about is how we nurture, you see my little watering pitcher, and we're like nurturing the harmony state um, so that you can have more periods of harmony. Um, and when you have that sense of like, gosh, we've got this, and so when the rupture happens, you're, it's, it's much easier to move through the rupture repair process if you've really nurtured that harmony state and that connection with your partner. Um, so engaging in ongoing relationship care practices, right? So having fun together, Laughter is so good. Um, the ingredients for vitality in relationships, this comes out of research that Esther Perel has done, is imagination, playfulness, curiosity, excitement, ongoing renewal. So really changing things up, so huge. Um, you know, Brene Brown in her podcast recently talked about where one of her energy resources that she kind of forgot about in her research, but she's returning to right now because it's really fueling her and her family is the energy of play and how important play is. Um, that is a big component of, uh, for me, for my own partnership and my relationships with family, lots of play, lots of getting outside. Um, and that's intentionally put into our schedule and prioritized because I know that it um, contributes to good relationships. So that's all I got. <laughs> so now we can do Q and A. And if Quinn, you want to stop the recording.